Okay, so today, as I said, we're going to talk about the discipline of introspection. And uh, Webster's dictionary, uh, dictionary defines uh, introspection this way. It says it's a reflective looking inward, an examination of one's own thoughts and feelings. Or to use kind of a biblical phrase that we're more uh, familiar with maybe, it's examine yourself, right? That's what <laughs> introspection is about, is in examining ourselves. And the benefits of introspection are, are many, but a few things uh, that it can do is we are looking closely at our lives and where we are with the Lord, how we're doing in life, is it can keep us from falling away from the Lord, uh, first of all, uh, very importantly. And it also can keep us growing in our faith as we're uh, attentive to what's going on in my spirit. You know, what am I, uh, how, are, how am I walking out the Christian life? Am I looking more and more like Jesus or is the opposite happening or nothing happening? Uh, and it also then, as a result of those two things, can keep us from a lot of regret, you know, a lot of regrets in our life. Uh, if we're kind of keeping short accounts of our own life. So let's look at some things the Bible says about introspection today. So we're going to start in Galatians 6, verse 3. I'll read there, Galatians 6, verse 3. It says, For if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But each one must examine his own work, and then he will have reason for boasting in regard to himself alone, and not in regard to another. For each one will bear his own load. And so Galatians 6.3, first of all, is telling us to be honest with ourselves, right? To look at ourselves, you know, honestly, uh, not to deceive ourselves. And, and one of the ways we can do that, we can be honest with ourselves, is to avoid kind of uh, congratulating ourselves. You know, uh, sometimes we joke about someone hurting their arm, patting their back, right? <laughs> uh, because we know that, you know, that's, that's something that can, we can fall into. We're kind of, you know, congratulating ourselves. But uh, Galatians 6.3 would exhort us to avoid that by not overestimating, first of all, our spirituality. In 1 Corinthians 10.12, it says, uh, Let him who thinks he stands take heed that he does not fall. That's from 1 Corinthians 10, 13, and the verses after that are the classic verses that deal with temptation. You know, the enemy tries to convince us that we can't be tempted in some area of life. That's one of his lies that he gives to us, that we can't be tempted by one or another thing. Maybe it's something we've battled with in the past and we feel like now we've got victory over it. Uh, maybe it's something we never thought we could be tempted by for whatever reason. But we need to watch out because those things that we think would never tempt us, they can tempt us. We need to avoid having this sort of confidence in our own ability, you know, in our flesh, to avoid temptation. Uh, you might want to turn in your Bible to Proverbs chapter 3 because I'm going to read from a number of Proverbs uh, here in the next few minutes. So Proverbs chapter 3, starting at verse 5. But mark your place in Galatians 6 because we will come back to there. And so Proverbs 3, 5 and following says, uh, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make your paths straight. We probably all have memorized those verses, or many of us have. But then it continues in verse 7, Proverbs 3, 7, Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. It will be healing to your body and refreshment to your bones. You know, when we say to ourselves, I'd never fall into this temptation or that temptation, you know, we're kind of trusting in ourselves, aren't we? Instead of in the Lord, really trusting in our own understanding of the situation, like, oh, no, I, I can avoid that because I know what's going on there and all this sort of thing. Instead of, of doing that, uh, we need to trust God in our areas of weakness and recognize that we can still be tempted there. Not to mean that, that doesn't mean that we can't learn about what tempts us and avoid it, then we should do that. Uh, but we need to ultimately trust in the Lord and be reaching out to Him for that protection. That's what really brings health is when we rely upon the Lord. Rather than sort of, you know, kind of being wise in our own eyes, as it says here, that we, that we fear the Lord and turn away from evil. So it's in that fear of the Lord that we're turning away really by His power. 
we also keep a right view of ourselves and we avoid this, this tendency to kind of congratulate ourselves uh, when we refuse to sort of overestimate our value uh, in life. I'm going to read from Proverbs 25. So if you turn to Proverbs, you can go forward in the book of Proverbs to chapter 25, verse 6. Proverbs 25, verse 6 says, Do not claim honor in the presence of the king, and do not stand in the place of great men. For it is better that it be said to you, Come up here, than for you to be placed lower in the presence of the prince whom your eyes have seen. That was from Proverbs 25, 6 and 7. And you know, that's kind of the exact opposite of what our culture teaches today, isn't it? It always uh, values assertiveness and trying to take the lead spot and all this sort of thing, but this is saying kind of the opposite. You know, take the place of humility. It's better to be called up than to be put down. And I think, you know, there's a lot of people out there in the labor market nowadays that don't, don't understand that. You know, they've sort of been trained by their upbringing to think that they're the more, most important person in any room. And they may get that from their education and things too. I don't know, different ways that we may be taught that. Uh, you think about all the way back to some of the, the peewee sporting leagues out there, Little League or whatever, and, and we gave everyone a trophy just for showing up. You know, even though they, they didn't actually maybe win a game, they still got a trophy. And so this sort of thing kind of makes us think sometimes maybe that we're worth more than we are. Not that we're not worth infinitely uh, a lot in God's eyes, but to say that, you know, to make ourselves feel like we're better than other people for some reason, just because we are who we are. But instead, we want to take the, the position of humility, right? That's what the Bible says, that we need to have humble hearts and not think of ourselves more highly than others, but more lowly than others, uh, so that we can minister and so forth. That's what we really need is proper humility, not a sense of entitlement. To recognize that any position that I have, any accomplishments in my life, those really are to the glory of God. Those are things that He's given me. They're not things that I just deserve in and of myself. In John 19, verse 10, you might recall this uh, account when Jesus is standing there before Pilate and they're having this discussion and Pilate says to him, you do not speak to me. Do you not know that I have authority to release you and I have authority to crucify you? Jesus answered, you would have no authority over me unless it had been given you from above. And that's that proper you know, understanding. Jesus illustrates for us there to understand that if I have this position, then God let me have that position. He gave me that position. It's not because of me in the end. And as Christians, of course, we're not immune to this temptation to think that we're, we're somehow special, you know, from everyone else in the world. And, and to some degree, of course, we all are all special. We're all unique, but we're all equal in that uniqueness, right? That everyone is unique, uh, not one of us greater than another. Uh, sometimes we can begin to think our position before God is special in some way, that it's greater somehow than others around us. These are temptations of the enemy or that the ministry we have, whatever that is, is, is somehow greater than the ministry of others. And sometimes these sort, sort of things come is, is if we allow ourselves to give in to a, a subtle temptation of, of flattery. You know, when people say nice things about us, we kind of take it to heart, right? Instead, we need to practice giving God the glory. Uh, when people say nice things about us, recognizing really it's God's glory. It's, you know, and sometimes we can't maybe say that with our mouths, but in our minds to recognize that it's to God's glory. If God has blessed us in some way in this life, if he's gifted us in some way in this life, we realize it's all him. It was all his uh, doing that we have these things. Not to say there's no work involved, but the Lord is still the one who gave the ability even to do the work. Uh, and so we want to we want to keep that in mind. We don't want to allow ourselves to, for example, become the focus uh, of, of praise. You know, when, when people are talking about maybe something going on in our lives or something that we've done, we don't want to allow ourselves to become the focus of praise. We want to make sure that Jesus receives the praise, that he is the focus of the praise because he is the one who deserves it. Along these same lines, we must resist the temptation to kind of overestimate our impact in this world. Whenever we're part of something where God has been moving, Satan tries to uh, convince us that it couldn't happen without us, that somehow we're so vital in the process. 
uh, you know, for example, when you talk with someone or, or someone's uh, giving you their testimony about their life and ministry, we want to look at that and say, well, who's the hero in this story, right? Whenever we share stories like that, God should always be the hero, right? Not us. It's not because, oh, we were so faithful and we were so, you know, this or that. No, the Lord is the one who should receive the glory. He should always be the hero uh, as we tell stories about what God has done. We so easily lose sight of the fact that, as it says in James 1.17, that any good thing in our life is the, what God has given to us. Uh, that's from James 1.17. I'm paraphrasing. It's but it's not truly because of our ability. It's because of, really, it's the Lord who is blessing. And if we've been privileged to be a part of anything that God is doing, it's because the Lord wanted us to be there and He was working. I'm going to read from Acts chapter 2. So we're, we're done in Proverbs, but uh, we'll come back to Galatians 6 in a minute. But if you want to look at Acts 2, 42, these are verses I'm, I'm sure are familiar to many of you. Acts 2, beginning at 42. Acts 2.42 says, They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone kept feeling a sense of awe, and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. And all those who had believed were together and had all things in common. And they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all as anyone might have need. Day by day, continue with one in mind, with one mind in, t in the temple and breaking bread from house to house. They were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. And so these verses in Acts chapter 2 describe an exciting time in the early church history. I mean, things are just happening everywhere. You know, church is growing, all this ministry is happening. And of course, the Christians we read were doing a lot of things within that. But at the end there, in verse 47, it makes it clear it was the Lord who was adding to the church. He was the one doing that work. And that's what real ministry looks like, doesn't it? It's really the Lord who's doing the work. And that's why... Uh, Jesus told us in Luke 17, verse 10, and I'm sorry I'm throwing a lot of verses at you today. I hope it's not uh, overwhelming you, but Luke 17, 10, uh, Jesus said, When you do all things which are commanded, you say, We are unworthy slaves. We have done only that which we ought to have done. Right? And so the point is that really it's the Lord doing the work. We can't add to His will. We can only be obedient in His will. You know, we can't be productive, as it were, and add something else that, hey, God, I just added this into what, you know, you were trying to do. No, that would be disobedience at that point, right? We only can do what he wants us to do if we're going to follow him. He's ultimately the one doing it then also. He works through us, kind of a mysterious way, but he works through us. But ultimately, God is the one, if there's any spiritual fruit, he's the one who's really doing it. Well, coming back to our uh, verses then in Galatians chapter 6, where we're talking about introspection, verse 4 uh, says, Each one must examine his own work, and then he will have reason for boasting in regard to himself alone and not in regard to another. That's Galatians 6, 4. And so what verse 4 is telling us to do is, is do an honest self-examination. It's healthy for us to reflect on what God has done in our lives and through our lives. It's healthy to look at those things and, and understand that. You know, there's kind of a misconception out there of what humility is today. Uh, many people think that humility means to think that I'm not worth anything. That if I think poorly of myself, that somehow I'm the most humble person on the earth. That's not really a right understanding of humility. Uh, you know, nor is it is it uh, wrong for us to be happy about gifts God's given us and how God's changed our lives and what God's done through our lives. That's not wrong for us to be thankful for those things. That's not uh, you know inconsistent with humility. Galatians six four tells us to instead to examine our work that, and many translations say that we may rejoice. We'll talk about that more in a minute. But looking at what God's done in and through us, I mean, it should result in that, right? It should result in us praising Him. We're blessed to see that. I'm so blessed to see that I'm so different than I was over 25 years ago, roughly, when I got saved. 
I'm so glad to see that I'm not the same way I was back then. Now, I'm not perfect, but I know I'm not like that. Praise the Lord. I see so many things that he's done, and I give him praise for it because I recognize he's the one who did it. It wasn't me. It was him. There's a popular quote out there that says, Humility is not thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less. It's not thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less. I think that's a good thought. You know, when our thoughts are often on ourselves, we do fall into pride, don't we? When we're thinking about ourselves a lot, we fall into pride. Even those who are sort of running themselves down, you know, is someone who has sort of a, a negative self-image. Well, if you're caught up in that, you're still all about yourself, right? You're still thinking about you all the time. It's, it's a self-centeredness. And it's a form of pride then that we become consumed with ourselves. We need to avoid that and not think about ourselves all, all the time. Think about the Lord. Think about others and how we might be a blessing. As we look at Galatians 6, uh, 4 and 5, verse 5 then says, For each one will bear his own load. And verse 4 I already read said uh, that each one will have reason for boasting in regard to himself alone. And that the New American Standard there kind of throws us a monkey wrench in, in that it translates it as boasting. That throws us off a little bit. I think a better translation, and what your translation may say to, in your uh, Bible, is rejoice. Because clearly we're not to be boastful. And, and the word really doesn't mean, in the end, rejoicing. The idea, the Greek word I should say, the idea in verse 4 is that we don't compare ourselves uh, to others. Think about from Luke chapter 18. I won't turn there, but Luke chapter 18. Remember there was a Pharisee and a tax collector who went to uh, the temple and so forth, and uh, the, the Pharisee is looking at the tax collector and saying, man, thank you, I'm not like this guy over here. You know, I'm so glad that I do all these religious works, and I'm not like that, you know. I mean, this is exactly what we should not do, right? <laughs> I mean, this guy thinks he's more spiritual. He's proving he's less spiritual than the tax collector. We need to rejoice uh, to the Lord for anything good he's done in us without comparing ourselves to others, Verse 5 then does exhort us to bear our own load. And uh, whereas, you know, the first temptation will be to compare ourselves to someone we think may be lesser than us in some way, and therefore we think we look better, you know, than them. And we're like, oh, look, look how much better I am than so-and-so, uh, like, the, like the Pharisee did. Well, the temptation in bearing that is uh, implied in bearing our own load is the temptation to compare ourselves to someone that is greater than us someone who is greater than us in our minds, uh, that to understand that we're not being held to the standard of their load. Each one of us has a load the Lord gives us. That's the load that the Lord's looking at, to see, are you bearing the load I've given you? You think about Billy Graham, for example, who in the 20th century led millions to Christ. Huge evangelistic ministry all around the world, literally. Uh, and that was God's load for him. That was God's call for him. That's what God intended for him to do. But my load and your load uh, are not the same as each other and not the same as Billy Graham. God's plans for all of us are different. And so we must not compare ourselves to someone else's calling and someone else's enabling for ministry. We need to look only at what God has, has given us to do and see, am I doing that? Am I being faithful in that? Am I being obedient in that? Right? That's what I really... Uh, that's what God's looking at in my life. And we trust the results into God. As we read from Acts chapter 2, God's going to ultimately do the work through us. But are we being obedient? Are we following through with those things that we know he's telling us to do? When we compare ourselves to others that in our minds somehow we see as greater than us, you know, it opens us up to all kinds of sin uh, in the end also. It opens us up to envy of that person. <clears throat> or of their ministry, or whatever thing in their life we're looking at. It opens us up to self-pity, and it gives the enemy a huge point of attack in our lives. So we don't want to fall into this comparing of ourselves to others in the world. We want to look at the Lord's load for us and, and say, you know, am I, am I following the Lord in this? And so we're talking about introspection today, taking an honest look at ourselves. But, you know, as Christians, we realize we need so much more than our own opinion, Right? Our own opinion only goes so far. We need to submit ourselves to God's examination of our lives. 
I'm going to read from Psalm 139. I don't think you'll need to turn there because it's a very familiar verse. Psalm 139, verses 23 and 24 says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxious thoughts, and see if there be any hurtful way in me, and lead me in the everlasting way. That was from Psalm 139. I mean, should that not be the desire of all of us who are believers today, that God will change our hearts and lead us in His ways, that we'll follow in His ways, that as we've been reborn spiritually, as salvation, that we be transformed from our worldly thinking, our worldly uh, speaking, and our worldly doing. In short, that God will sanctify us through and through, as it says in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 23. The problem in our sanctification, though, is that there needs to be a willingness on our part in it. You know, we need to be willing uh, in this process. God will instruct us where we need to change, God empowers us for the change, but he doesn't force us to respond correctly to him. The choice is always, always ours. And don't we wish it wasn't, right? I mean, honestly, as Christians, we wished it, that we didn't have to make the choice, that we would just always do what God wants us to do. That would be perfect, but God never takes away our freedom, our free will. You know, when you look at things like academics, uh, sports, getting a driver's license, things like this, we realize that examinations that we undergo are important. Those examinations help us to see where we are, and they help us to see where we need to improve, right? Uh, that, that's what examinations do. And examinations or tests are often difficult when we deal with them. They can be draining mentally, physically, even emotionally. If anyone's ever done a, a late night you know, cram fest before a test, you know how that is, you know, that, that stress, you know, before the test. Uh, but they serve a purpose in finding out how we're doing. That's what the test ultimately does. Helps to see, do we get it? You know, are we, are we learning what we need to learn and so forth? In God's examination, he always, here, he also uses tests. And for that, if you would turn with me to Hebrews chapter 12, so near the very back of your Bible is Hebrews, right before 1 Peter, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 3. And Hebrews is a pretty long book, so you'll probably be able to find it near the back of your Bible. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 3. And I'll begin reading there. It says, For consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. You have not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood, and you're striving against sin. And you have forgotten the exhortation which is addressed to you as sons. My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor faint when you are reproved by him. For those whom he loves, for those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines, and he scourges every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you endure. God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? But if you are without discipline, of which all become partakers, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Furthermore, we had earthly fathers to discipline us. And we respected them. Shall we not much rather be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as seemed best to them. But he disciplines us for our good, so that we may share his holiness. All discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful, but sorrowful. Yet to those who have been trained by it afterwards, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. So that's in Hebrews chapter 12. And, you know, God uses discipline in our lives as a means of testing and, and really proving us, like gold is proven to show its quality. But first, we must understand that any discipline in our lives, as it says in verses 6 through 8 there, actually reflects God's love for us. It's not God's disapproval. It's because He loves us. That's why He brings discipline. Sometimes in life, we, we, we look around, we wonder why uh, some people who are lost 
seem to just totally get away with their sin, right? It seems like there's no repercussions, perhaps passing completely through this life with, with no apparent accountability. Now, we know after this life, there is plenty of accountability, but maybe they got all the way through this life and there was no accountability. Well, according to verse 8, this actually proves they're not God's sons. He didn't discipline them. He let them just kind of go their way, right? And so that's what this is telling us. But God doesn't let his children sort of, quote, get away with sin. But hear me, discipline is not always related to sin in our lives. A lot of discipline in our lives from the Lord is not because... There's something he needs to uh, remove from our lives, but it's because he's wanting to grow our faith. And so rather than being discouraged by discipline when it comes into our lives, we should be encouraged because it's evidence of our sonship in the Lord or that we are children of God. And although God's discipline is not constant, meaning we do get a break from the trials, thank the Lord, uh, it does persist through our lives. It's just a normal part of every Christian's life. And so in a strange way, a difficult trial is, is kind of a compliment from the Lord. And when you think about it that way, uh, like it says in James chapter 1. In James chapter 1, I'll just read from verses 2 through 4. It says, Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its perfect result, so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Now, we would never seek out trials, right? And the trials are not joyful, like we read in Hebrews 12, verse 11. But there is joy in knowing that God is using those trials to bring about spiritual maturity in our lives. He's disciplining us through it. He's sanctifying us through it. He's making us more like Jesus. Along these lines, then, uh, discipline reflects God's desire for our best. And that's what we see, really, in Hebrews chapter 12, uh, verses 9 through 10. We see sanctification there. It, says, it talks about our earthly fathers and how our earthly fathers may not have always been correct in their motives in our discipline. Their motives may have been wrong at times. They may have been in the flesh, as it were. But God's motive is always trustworthy. Look at verse 10. It says, For they disciplined us for a short time as seemed best to them, but he disciplines us for our good, so we may share his holiness. Therefore, you know, we can trust him even when we don't understand. You know, in the Gospel of Mark, a few weeks back as we were studying through it, we studied the disciples, you know, sort of in the boat there. They were uh, in the boat in Mark 4, and as Jesus was asleep in the stern, the, the storm kind of kicks up, and they're all freaking out. You know, they're, they're all worried and scared for their lives, actually. It must have been quite a storm. But, you know, Jesus allowed that because he wanted them to see they could trust him even when things were scary. Right? That was the point, that he was going to take care of them. And he wanted to grow that ability in them to see that. Finally, God's discipline, Hebrews 12, 11 tells us, will bring about spiritual fruit in us. Now, sadly, you know, some things, uh, it seems like we only learn them through difficulty. As much as that frustrates us, you know, we'd rather not have difficulty in our lives. But it seems like there are some lessons that we only learn when we go through difficulty. That's not a limitation on God's part, but really, I guess, it just reflects a weakness in us and maybe the hardness of our hearts. We have to be sort of shocked into change, you know, and, and God needs to sort of, you know, maybe cut away our support mechanisms for a little while so that we'll grow in some way. I know a few years ago, many of you know that I had sort of a dramatic uh, injury in my wrists. Both my wrists were extremely uh, sensitive and painful from uh, carpal tunnel. Uh, brought on through some unique circumstances. And as a result of that, many of the uh, sort of you know coping mechanisms in my life were removed. You know, because my wrists were in pain, I couldn't play the sports I like to do that kind of helped me, you know, deal with stress. I couldn't play guitar, you know, that also was something that uh, would help me wind down that sort of thing. Instead, I just had to go to the Lord, you know, and he was, he was growing me in that area. He was growing me in other ways too, but he's growing me in that area. And of course, it is good to 
you know, have these sort of activities to help us, you know, uh, relieve stress and so forth. I'm not against that at all. But the Lord was wanting me to, to really depend on Him and see my dependence on Him, even above these blessings that He has given me. In verse 11, then, it says that, uh, you know, when we have been trained by it, afterwards it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. It tells us this discipline is to train us, and our focus in the trial uh, really needs to be to look for God in that trial, to look to Him. Our flesh wants to tend to pull away from God when we're in difficulty, uh, but we need to keep coming back to God. We need to cling to Him even more closely, more tightly in those in those trials, asking Him, as we read in James chapter 1, uh, as asking Him for wisdom asking Him for insight, asking Him for guidance and for help in the situation, asking Him to reveal any wrong way in us, like we like we read from Psalm 139. Maybe this discipline is because of sin that the Lord's wanting to point out. Uh, but as I said, oftentimes it's just for our uh, spiritual growth. But this whole process, this is what we're talking about with introspection. We're not running from God in the trial. We're drawing closer to Him, and we're seeking Him out, asking Him, uh, all these sorts of questions, asking him for help, asking him things like, you know, Lord, what needs to change in me? Or what are you changing in me through this trial? Help me to see that. Help me to be encouraged by that. You know, what is your direction for me in this today? Give me what I need just for today in this trial and give him praise as he does that. And asking him even, Lord, how does this reveal more of who you are to me as I go through this? And so, you know, the trials we face, the discipline, the examination, it will end, right? It doesn't continue forever. It will end. But whether it brings about the peaceful fruit of righteousness really depends on us. It depends on our focus through it. If we just sort of focus on ourselves and what we can do and how we feel and all that, we're probably not going to get much out of it, right? We've seen that in the, in the, in the disciples as we've been studying the Gospel of Mark, that Jesus did it for miracles, and it says they didn't get anything out of it. They learned nothing from it, you know, because they weren't really introspective and thinking about what is the Lord doing here, that sort of thing. We want to bring our focus and all of our problems to the Lord. We want to practice introspection this way, and through that, we are going to see spiritual growth, even through uh, these trials. So let's close our time now with prayer. Lord Jesus, uh, we are thankful to you that uh, you love us so much that you do discipline us, not because you're displeased, but because you want to bring out what's best in us. You want to make us more like you, which is our desire also. We want to be godly people in this life. We want to be a witness for you, a light for you. And we know that's only possible by your power. And so we pray, Lord, you'd help us to be introspective, to look at our lives and examine ourselves and see the things that you've done and maybe things that you're doing and to give you praise for those things and to be patient as you do uh, other uh, disciplining actions in our lives to make us more like you. We give you glory for the great God that you are and we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.